did this collaborative research project come about? And what were some of the essential themes and questions that your teams felt needed to be addressed, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? This is basically a continuation of the initiative to have cross-regional collaboration for human rights protection, especially toward migrant workers in East and Southeast Asia started 2018. Uh, the collaboration between my organization, Human Rights Working Group, and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. In recent years, the demand for migrant workers from Southeast Asia to East Asia is higher than ever before. The interdependence on migrant labor between countries and region is on the rise. Population aging, increasing women's economic participation, economic growth, development are some trends of driving factors of migration. In this situation, a cross-regional platform for dialogue and cooperation between two regions is become increasingly important. At the same time, East and Southeast Asia are not the exception to the global trends of the rising of sectarian population, nationalism, migrants are seen as others, often becoming scapegoat and discriminated against. One of the roots of the problem faced by migrant worker and member of their family is the fact that migrant worker have been governed by policies made upon strong national interests in both countries of origin and destination. However, despite an increasing trends of migrants between two regions, there is still an absence of cross-regional cooperation, especially among civil society, non-state actor who are playing a very significant role in response to the needs of migrant worker and supporting their work. During this COVID-19 pandemic, many countries are turning their back on the vulnerable migrant workers and even blaming them for the spread of the disease instead providing the support they need. The negative impact of immigration are more often thought about than significant contribution of migrant workers make. At the same time, the pandemic has brought difficulty to our work as a civil society to voicing out our concern to raise awareness on the plight of marginalized people and migrant workers become one of the most vulnerable groups. In this emergency situation like COVID pandemic, we had come up with a decision to conduct cross-regional study in order to better understand human rights situation of migrant workers in this region. One of the main challenges during pandemic is that it has very difficult for civil society actors to visit people who are concerned about their human rights, gather information about their situation and advocate at the national, regional and international level. Benefiting from our CSO network that have been already built across East and Southeast Asia, this research was able to gather very rich data, information, including testimonies of affected migrant workers themselves. Focusing on major destinations in this region, we have conducted a joint research on COVID-19 response measures and their impact on the rights of migrant workers in order to improve the protections of migrant workers across regionally. In December, your teams presented a new book entitled Repression and Resilience, COVID-19 Response Measures and Migrant Workers' Rights in Major East and Southeast Asian Destinations. Could you first give us a rundown of the research that was conducted for this book and talk about some of the trends or any common points that this research picked up um, across the region? Yes, and given the emerging situations that outlined by um, Danielle, this scoping study was conducted with three main objectives. So the first is to assess the impact of COVID-19 response measures and also pre-existing migration policies on the rights of migrant workers during the pandemic. The second is to explore how vulnerabilities of migrant workers translate into their lived experiences and how state and non-state actors responded to the challenges faced by migrant workers. And the last but not least, we also wanted to amplify voices of of people who are affected and bring these voices to multi-stakeholders at national and regional level. So this study focused on situations in destinations of migrant workers. So we covered seven destinations, which are Hong Kong, Japan, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, 
and South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. So we worked with field researchers in these seven destinations who are working directly with migrant workers, uh, either as a practitioners providing direct support to, to these um, migrant workers communities or uh, who are community-based researchers. So these field researchers gather data during the period of mainly between um, July and se September in 2020 and before the publication was developed. We tried to fill the gap in the public discourses around the pandemic, which overemphasizes statistics. And we wanted to bring the lived experiences and stories of migrant workers. And this was possible because of the trusted relationships of our field researchers has already built with the migrant workers they work with. Um, their extended local knowledge also enabled us to include information and data from local sources that are available in their local languages uh, into our analysis. Some of the common challenges faced by migrant workers during the pandemic include, but not limited to, immobility, both locally and internationally, uh, limited or no access to healthcare or PPE, uh, financial difficulties due to job loss and inability to access or ineligibility for um, states financial assistance, um, exploitations and fair treatment at workplaces are also um, common issues. And there has been increasing a risk of human trafficking, as well as limited or no access to information. So these have resulted in the violation of the rights of these migrant workers, most, of, most obviously uh, the rights to health during the pandemic, and also the labor rights as, as workers. So the specific vulnerabilities of migrant workers were found in the situations where, um, for example, fear of immigration law enforcement uh, became barriers to many migrant workers, particularly those who are undocumented uh, or with irregular status in accessing essential care or support. And most migrant workers visas are tied to their employers and many of them live in accommodations provided by their employers. So this meant that um, those who lost their work faced the risk of losing their visas or homes so due to sense of uncertainties coming from these situations, as well as financial or emotional distress, immobilities or exploitations or increased surveillance by employers uh, resulted in worsening of the mental health conditions of migrant workers. So we concluded that these challenges faced by migrant workers are rooted in the way that they have been treated and positioned by the society since before the COVID-19 pandemic. Another reason for migrant workers' vulnerabilities during the COVID-19 was the fact that the nationality, citizenship, and the migration status have been used as a criteria for essential services and supports that are available. So migrant workers are not able to participate fully in their society because of their immigration status. And inclusion and exclusion was based on what passport they have they have or what visas they have. So uh, even during the pandemic, uh, within the, this access to, to support and care, uh, there's, there has been the reproduction of uh, border controls during the crisis. So in these situations, uh, local NGOs and self-help self groups um, played significant roles in humanitarian assistance, uh, disseminating information or uh, information in accessible forms, uh, providing cultural support, culturally sensitive support or signposting to more professional um, service and care. Based on this research and, and some of these commonalities you see, what are some of the over or overall um, recommendations that came out of this research on the ground? As a collective initiative, um, this joint research proposed a guideline for protecting the rights of migrant workers during the public health, health crisis, such as COVID-19. So it begins with a general principle, which states the recognition of specific vulnerabilities of migrant workers, which I have touched upon, and also the community resilience and the importance of meaningful participation um, is included. So the general principle also calls for no discriminatory criteria uh, for essential services, as well as the needs for clear separation between immigration law enforcement and the public health uh, service provisions. 
And the main part of the, this guideline talks about the seven specific areas of rights that are significant for migrant workers. So including the rights to healthcare, information, decent work and social protection, uh, safe and fair immigration process, a protection from trafficking, safe living conditions, and the rights of migrant workers who are in hard to reach workplace. Um, so the final section of this guideline also calls for support for the resilience of civil societies, including migrant workers and their supporters, and the continuous cooperation among countries of origin and the destinations. And we request uh, power holders such as the government, international organizations and donor organizations to work alongside with the grassroots movement of migrant workers and supporters communities and distribute more resources to them. So for example, like as a recommendation, for vaccination programs, which is starting in some countries, based on our guideline, we'd like to see the states not using nationality, citizenship or immigration status as a criteria for people to receive vaccines. But this is a public health crisis. So without pro protecting the most vulnerable, uh, the society is not protected as a whole. So no one is safe until everyone is safe. Kind of jumping off from the more specific research questions to a, a bit of a broader question, I'd like to turn back to Daniel. Um, in your note in the introduction to, to the book we're discussing, um, you kind of brought up this theory that this global pandemic, since it's such a huge shock and it's you know reverberated around the world and kind of changed life as we know it, at the same time can also serve as a critical moment of transformation. So in light of some of these conclusions that came out of the book and this research, how do you think that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic may provide an opportunity to really reassess and to strengthen um, these networks in support of creating a more resilient system that does in fact protect migrant workers? Uh, the COVID pandemic really shows us how the universality of uh, things is really important. Like, the virus doesn't uh, know the nationality. They doesn't have religion. They don't. They don't have any kinds of races. They just attack everyone. And then, so the approach that uh, almost every government now impose is just uh, merely like protecting their citizen, their nationals, as the mandate of their constitution. Of course, it's not enough because in your uh, country, there's not only your citizen uh, living on your country, but also everybody, you know, like, like uh, you know, the, the migrant worker, the tourists, uh, even those who are undocumented, refugee, asylum seeker, and so on and so forth. So by having this, uh, the pandemic, the hit of the COVID, I get like a, a vehicle to easier way to explain how important to work uh, in the basis of uh, universality, not, uh, uh, not, not working uh, based on particular criteria such as religion, uh, nationality, races, and then and some other identity basically. So I think it's a good momentum to us to really relook at um, almost all policies basically, whether they're inclusive for everybody or not. If the policies are not inclusive, then there is something wrong basically with, with the policies how its country or region deals with the pandemic, there is no such a fixed template. This time we see there are massive policy experiments taken in a very short period of time. In this emergency situation, the option somehow very limited, somehow only two options. Do we have to give up or struggle? Do we want to deal it with pandemic alone, which is using nationalistic isolation, which may only empowering the authority, or do we want to face it together, build an international cooperation and more empowering the society? This is sometimes the option. And our study, the result of the study, suggests choosing not to give up rather than surrender and building up international cooperation by empowering society as the antithesis of the pandemic knowing that there is no single country ready and can deal with it alone. The idea is upholding human rights and democratic principle really necessary to protect one of the most vulnerable group. We believe that only with solidarity and cooperation 
and an inclusive policy, we can deal better. So that's why it is really important to take a momentum to really reassess the system of protections of migrant worker, as well as touching upon the democratic governance, uh, the democratic challenging, including to invite migrant worker uh, in, in every single decision-making uh, process. What do you see as the critical steps that should be taken in order to support this kind of broader collaboration um, across the region? Like for instance, in my region in ASEAN, so this Asia, there have been a lot of uh, effort and political commitment uh, jointly responding the, the, the pandemic. Of course, we can criticize, we have to be really critical in the way we really uh, see whether their political commitment have been implemented or not, or just only political commitment, good written on the paper. It is something that, of course, we need to acknowledge the process in, in the regional of ASEAN. While in East Asia, we observe that, you know, the response of each Asia country, they have richer experience in dealing with public health crisis, and they have some available resources. So one platform that maybe uh, can be uh, uh, supported in these areas of cooperation, where maybe in Southeast Asia context, we have very strong uh, regionalism such as ASEAN as some avenue to discuss any single issues, while in East Asia, you have uh, richer resources, then a cross-regional cooperation can be strengthened, like for instance, under the platforms of ASEAN plus three, for instance. So the initiative to come up uh, with the ASEAN Regional Center on Public Health Emergencies and Emergency Diseases, uh, you know, like it is uh, uh, just recently last year uh, 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 announced uh, during the Vietnam chairmanship, it is really supported by the Japanese government. In a way, ASEAN have, uh, have a center on public health emergencies. So I think it is something idea that we can also uh, collaborate cross-regionally. The other uh, idea or areas is of course bilateral cooperation and also uh, you know like international cooperation such as using the global compact of migration uh, platform that it is also inviting the participation of migrant workers. So for the context of Japan, I think we'd like to see um, both states and non-state actors more involved in the cross cross border and cross regional initiatives in protecting migrant workers' rights because migration is a continuous process, starting from the recruitment of migrant workers and pre-departure process in their countries of origins, through their life in Japan, and until repatriations and reintegration into their homes. So challenges faced by migrant workers are rooted in the situation of both countries of origin and destinations, and also including some transition, the places of transitions in some cases. So at the same time, you know, we. Also from the human rights perspective, it is important to think beyond bilateral corporations, which the state's governance of migration is usually based on through bilateral MOU between countries. But this is because even if we are successful in eliminating exploitation of migrant workers from one specific country, we will continue to see another group of migrant workers being exploited if we don't work on improvement of, of rights of migrant, protection of my, rights of migrant workers regionally and internationally based on the universalities of human rights. So during this public health crisis, Japan has seen devastating impact on migrant communities uh, who have been treated by the government as a temporary labor force rather than human beings with a livelihood, uh, civil society actors who have been filling the gaps of public supports that are not available are accessible for migrant communities are experiencing exhaustion out of this long period of pandemic. So we need to take this momentum for more collective and collaborative advocacy for better protection of migrant workers' rights, not only in Japan, but also together with our neighboring countries in order to create a more resilient and sustainable environment for all. So there is still limited um, Japanese actors' involvement in regional cooperation, especially in the area of protection of migrants' rights. Uh, we need and we want to 
continue working and to build stronger networks and cooperation among civil society in East and Southeast Asia, utilizing any platforms available, especially including this um, the vital work that Hasakapis Foundation has been doing in these two regions. 